I'm Charlie and today we're going to look at what if two black holes collided? But before we get into it, subscribe and why not press the notification bell too. Black holes can be big or small, but one of the most amazing kinds of black holes are supermassive black holes. These have masses which range from millions or billions of suns. They sit at the center of the most massive galaxies across our universe. And there are even some in our galaxy, the Milky Way. What's interesting is right now, we don't know how supermassive black holes come to be. We understand black holes, but we don't know how supermassive black holes get so big. One theory is it could happen from a supernova. A supernova is when a star explodes, blasting part of that star into space. But let's say something very unlikely happens and two black holes merge together. This can sometimes happen during a merger of galaxies. This is something we do see in our universe, but thankfully our galaxy the Milky Way has not merged with another galaxy before. If two black holes collided, they would release gravitational waves. These would be fluctuations in the fabric of space-time. Right now we can use simulations to predict these merges. Scientists have seen that these emit both gravitational waves and radiation. That's because when the two black holes collide, interstellar gas rises from them. This creates very hot radioactive waves. When the black holes fall towards one another, they merge into one. This cosmic clash would be very bad for any surrounding planets. If it happened too near to Earth, then radiation could take out some of the human population. It would be like Chernobyl, but in space, and about 10 million times worse. Right now, we actually don't have the facilities to observe supermassive black holes merging together. Scientists have simply used simulations to see what would happen, but we do have the technology to witness two normal black holes merging together. They can actually see what's happening inside these black holes. The human eye can't see a black hole because strong gravity pulls in all of the light, but scientists can measure how strong gravity affects the stars and gas around the black hole. They study the stars flying around or orbiting the black hole and then work out what would happen from them. They study the stars flying around or orbiting the black holes, and then using that data they work out what's happening. One theory is that if two big black holes merge together this could make a supermassive black hole. These are black holes which are about 10 times the size of a normal black hole. The reason why this may happen is because you're adding gravity into more gravity. It's kind of like the video game agar.io. If two worms collide, they merge into one even more powerful worm. And that's kind of a great metaphor for black holes, as they go around galaxies zapping up anything near them. But on that note, what happens to the matter which is dragged into a black hole? Where does it go and what happens to it? Well, to understand this, you need to know what the event horizon is. The event horizon is the space where light can escape from the black hole's gravitational field and a space where it can't. So, basically where the matter does and doesn't exist simultaneously. The matter in the event horizon becomes isolated from the rest of time and space. It effectively disappears from the universe that we exist in. Once inside the black hole, the matter will be torn apart into subatomic components. It then becomes stretched and squeezed until it becomes a part of the black hole and increases its size. And that's how black holes increase in size, again, kind of like the game agar.io. So hopefully now you understand a bit more about this mind-bending science humans know little about. It's kind of crazy to think black holes break the space-time continuum, but they do. What happened to the lost woman in space? The space race was filled with scandals. For example, the USA recruited many Nazi scientists to get them to the moon. And there's also various scandals on the other side of the space race, the Soviet Union. One such Soviet space mystery was discovered by two Italian brothers, Achille and Giovanni Battista. These Italian brothers operated radios which could reach signals in outer space. They did this for many years, not hearing anything too interesting. That was until November 1963 when they heard a very strange signal. The signal came directly from outer space. They were able to receive it and decode it. And when they did, they were stunned to hear the voice of a woman. The woman was very scared and in pain. She was on re-entry to Earth and she was crying out for help. Here is an audio clip of the actual signal they received. Many believe that she is actually the first woman to ever enter space. It's believed that she successfully entered space. But as she was coming back to Earth, there was a problem with her capsule. The cooling system of her capsule failed. This is exactly what happened to Laika, the Soviet space dog. This caused a fire in her capsule. 
and sadly that is where the first woman in space passed away. The brothers later won an award for their work and were able to visit NASA as a prize. The recordings these brothers got were from the secret missions during the Soviet Vostok program in the 1960s. It was shrouded in secrecy at the time, and when the Soviet Union fell, all of the records were destroyed. This means we won't know the true identity of that woman who was stuck in space on the recording. And it's believed that the woman on the recording is not the only lost cosmonaut. There have been at least two other cosmonauts, Ivan and Andre, who have been confirmed. So, who knows how many Soviet astronauts are floating around in space out there? These lost cosmonauts likely went too close to the sun and have now been burned up into nothing. And sadly, the woman on the recording's capsule likely burned up and is now space junk floating around. It's pretty creepy to think the lost cosmonauts are floating above us right now. That's how the world will end. So the first way the world will end is human extinction. When it comes to the end of the world, there have been many predictions. Just take the Mayan calendar saying the world will end in 2012. Some scientists even say a supervolcano may take us out, or a big asteroid. But remember, these are all predictions. However, the extinction of humans is not just a prediction, it's an inevitability. Look at the news and you'll see many headlines saying, we have too many people on Earth. After all, we have 7.5 billion people, so where will humans go? But remember, humans have only been around for under 1 million years. That is, in our current form. Slowly, over hundreds of thousands of years, humans will change. And as the Earth changes, different species die out. We often see this with animals, but barely ever think of it with us. So that's why many scientists say that within millions of years, humans won't be around any longer. We already have a rapidly changing planet with limited resources. For example, nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons are all things which could take us out. And there's also many natural pressures we face, for example, diseases. So, whether it's a supervolcano or an asteroid, or something more natural like a disease, humans will be wiped out. That will be the end of the world for humans. But just because we're not on it doesn't mean our Earth isn't there. So, let's look at another way the world will end. And that is boiling oceans. That's right, the Earth's oceans boiling. Many people don't realize this, but it's a massive coincidence our planet is at the distance it is from a star exactly as massive as our own. This allows our planet to support life, and of course allows our planet to have water, which is very uncommon for other planets in our solar system. For billions of years, the Earth and the Sun have been totally compatible, but as time goes on, the Sun will have massive changes. And thanks to the evolution of our Sun, our oceans won't be around for much longer. Right now, helium is building up in the Sun's core. This is the area of the Sun where nuclear fusion occurs, and as this expands, it will have terrible consequences for our planet. The sun is heating up at all times, expanding and emitting more power. And scientists say that in about 1 billion years, the sun will be giving off so much energy that we won't be able to handle it. And scientists say that within a few million years, the sun's temperature will get too hot for planet Earth. This high energy will hit the water molecules in the Earth's oceans, and this will effectively boil our oceans. As that happens, our atmospheres will fill with water vapor, but not like the kind you get from vape pens. Instead, this will be a very dangerous greenhouse gas causing the Earth's temperature to rise. Earth will then be more like Venus, and of course, this means it will be totally inhospitable to any life form at all. Next up, we have Reduction to Rock. Reduction to Rock sounds like an awesome band, but it isn't. It's actually one of the ways our world will end. Scientists say that eventually every atom of our atmosphere will be ejected from planet Earth, and the entire world's surface will be reduced to rock and charred ash. Every living creature and plant will be turned to dust. You may think this sounds like science fiction, but this really did happen to a planet in our solar system, Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, and in around 5 billion years, that's what will happen to Earth. You see, the Sun is running out of hydrogen fuel in its core, and when that happens, the core will heat up and fuse helium. You may think of helium as the chemical which allows you to speak in a high voice. Kind of like this. But inside the sun, it will release more energy than ever before. This will turn the sun from its current state to a gigantic burning red star. And sadly, little old Earth won't be able to withstand this and will perish. In around 5 billion years, the sun will be a hundred times its current diameter, and thousands of times brighter than it is today. This will mean every atom will be pushed out of our atmosphere on Earth. 
and planets which are already close to the sun like Mercury and Venus will be totally destroyed. After Earth has been roasted by the sun, the sun will reduce to being a white dwarf star. But that's not before it destroys our entire planet as well as Mercury and Venus. And the final fourth way the Earth will end is we will be swallowed or ejected. So even after all life is gone, our oceans are boiled and the Earth is just a charred crisp, it will still exist. It will be a really hot planet with no life orbiting around a central stellar corpse. That is until the final way our Earth will be totally wiped out forever. And it will either be swallowed or ejected. Basically, one of the following three things will happen. Either an object will collide with Earth, destroying it or engulfing it. This depends on the size and speed of the collision. This could happen at any time as the universe literally goes on forever. That is until a Google amount of years. Google is an incredibly large number. It's one digit followed by a hundred zeros. Many scientists say this is the estimated time for the heat death of our universe. Another way our Earth could be totally wiped out is gravity ejecting it from our solar system, and then eventually the galaxy entirely. This would basically shoot our Earth into an empty cosmos for eternity. Or perhaps it will be engulfed by the Sun's corpse. And then eventually the Sun's corpse as well as the Earth's corpse would be swallowed by a black dwarf star. So there we go, that's how Earth will end. Of course, Earth and the galaxy will eventually come to an end, as everything does. But make sure you live life to the fullest now, because you don't currently have to worry about it. Our ancestors millions or billions of years in the future will though. So if you're watching this from the future, then sorry, we had it easy. But what if we nuked the moon? So let's go back to Project A119. In the 1950s, the USA and Soviet Union were in a space race. And frankly, the Soviet Union was crushing the USA. They'd successfully sent their Sputnik satellite into space. So the American government thought it would be a good idea to nuke the moon. The government thought this would increase morale and show off American firepower. Would seeing the moon blow up increase your morale? I don't think so. Thankfully, this project was scrapped and then declassified in 2000. They didn't cancel it because they were worried it would harm the moon. Instead, it was because of a fear of negative public reaction. But what if 50 megatons of TNT, also known as a nuclear bomb, did go off on the moon? So that you can get an idea of how much damage this would cause, check out Hiroshima. Hiroshima was a gigantic Japanese city before it was destroyed by an atomic bomb. Well, one nuke would be the equivalent of 3,800 Hiroshima bombs. But amazingly, for a moon nuke to actually affect Earth, you would need 10 trillion megatons of TNT. That is because the moon is 384,400 kilometers away from Earth. If around 10 million megatons of TNT was used, then there would be a gigantic impact on Earth. The moon would be pushed out of the Earth's orbit, and this would cause lots of asteroids and meteors to smash into Earth. Gravity would also change, as well as our water levels, meaning our tides would flood all major cities by the sea. But it's still a good thing that Project A119 did not go ahead. That's because it could have caused catastrophic radiation levels on the moon. Right now in Hiroshima, people are still being born deformed because of the radiation from the atomic bomb. That bomb went off in the 1940s. Back in the space race, the military had plans to colonize the moon in 1967. Of course, this did not go ahead, but they didn't know that. So, back then, they did not want to ruin the land they were planning to colonize. The moon is not protected by an ozone layer much like Earth is. This leaves it open to cosmic rays and solar flares, which could negatively impact the planet. This means there is space radiation, and detonating a nuke on the moon would simply add to that radiation. The moon has lots of craters because of meteorites which have smashed into it. So, detonating a nuke would pretty much cause a gigantic crater, kind of like the ones the moon already has. This crater would likely be around 8 miles in diameter. If it was detonated on the lit side of the moon, then your eye may be able to see it. But if the nuke went off on the dark side of a new or crescent moon, your eye would probably see a blip of light for a few seconds. But it's also a logistics nightmare. If you try and transport a nuclear bomb to the moon and the rocket carrying it blows up on launch, then you will damage the Earth a lot. In fact, pretty much an entire country would be ruined. Of course, a nuke wouldn't blow up an entire country like the USA, but it would radiate at least 50% of it, meaning everyone would be very sick in the country. You'd also obliterate your launch facility, wasting billions or trillions of dollars. And if the rocket blows up while it's already pretty high in the sky, then you could cause an EMP. This is also known as an electromagnetic pulse. This would disable all electronics, causing an economic crash and technologies to fail. 
Telephone and internet signals would cease and streetlights would be blown out. Hard drives and digital electronics for miles would also be fried. So while detonating a nuke that we have on the moon may not cause too much trouble to Earth, we still should not try it. Too much could go wrong and it's also pretty pointless. Instead, we should focus on trying to get to the moon and build a lunar base. This new planet which has the highest possibility of alien life. So what is Tea Garden B? Well, it's now one of the 19 known exoplanets with potentially habitable environments. The planet orbits a neighboring star in the constellation of Aries, just 12.5 light years away. And astronomers say this planet has the greatest similarity to Earth out of any planet ever discovered. Despite not being in our solar system, the planet resembles planets which are in our solar system. The planet is only slightly heavier than Earth, and it's located in a habitable zone where water can be present in liquid form. The reason why this planet is named Tea Garden B is because it's nearby to the Tea Garden star. This star was discovered all the way back in 2003, but the discovery of this exoplanet is recent. Tea Garden B's star, named Tea Garden, is 10 times lighter than our own sun, and it's actually classified as an old red dwarf, being one of the smallest stars we know of. The star is roughly 8 billion years old and is very difficult to research as it's quite far away. But T Garden B was given an Earth Similarity Index score of 0.95. To put that into perspective, 1 is Earth. So on this scale, it's only 0.5 different from Earth. However, if we were to live on this planet, we'd have to get used to some changes. First off, their days are 5 days long. Or to be exact, 4.91 days long. That's how long their orbital period is. And nearby are two other planets named Tea Garden A and Tea Garden C. Tea Garden C is not very habitable, whereas Tea Garden A is. But Tea Garden B is by far the most habitable and similar to Earth. The planet also has a radius which is Earth-like and an Earth-like composition, that being an iron core and a rocky crust. And it also has an ocean of water on its surface. It has a surface temperature environment of 0 to 50 degrees Celsius, similar to Earth. It has a temperature surface environment of somewhere between 0 and 50 degrees centigrade. That's only slightly hotter than Earth. And the most normal temperature on this planet is 28 degrees centigrade. Now, many exoplanets have been discovered before Tea Garden B, but the issue is the stars near these exoplanets. Most of them are red dwarf stars which emit strong flares. This can wipe out the atmosphere and make planets uninhabitable. But Tea Garden B's star, Tea Garden, is very quiet and inactive. Also, we'd be able to harness the power of this host star and run everything off it. Unlike the relationship with the Sun and our planet Earth, it's not bad for the Earth's environment. The only difficulty with this exoplanet is that it's 12.578 light years away. But that's not to say in a few decades we couldn't get to this exoplanet and live on it. Maybe Elon Musk should spend less time trying to get to Mars and more time trying to get to T Garden B. Some testing also needs to be done on these planets' atmospheres. But if the atmospheres are okay, they could well be hospitable to live on. That's because this planet is made up partially of iron. Basically the same as our planet, but before all of the iron was mined out. And some experts also say there may be diamonds and gold on this planet. But if we did move to this planet, it would be a big adjustment, as the sun only sets every five days. We'd probably only get one dark sleep every other day. And every other sleep would have to be while it's still bright out. But compared to the wider universe, this exoplanet isn't too far away. It's actually the 24th nearest star system to our own. So hopefully now that this discovery has been made, Tea Garden B can be explored and researched a lot more. You never know, in a few decades, we may well be living on it. At what if Earth was a cube? Back in 1884, an astronomer named Ardent made headlines. He claimed to have discovered a new planet in orbit beyond Neptune. The thing that made this planet special was that it was a cube. Many believed him, including the New York Times who ran a piece about the planet. But it turned out to be total nonsense and made up. Hypothetically speaking though, what would happen to our world if it was a cube? Well, first off, everything we know about gravity would change. 
we would need to reshape every single equation related to gravitation. The amount of gravity every object on Earth has would significantly change. If Earth was a cube, gravity would be strongest at the center of each face. That's because the force of gravity increases closer to the center of gravity. As a result, all water in our atmosphere would be drawn towards the center of the faces of Earth. This means the edges of the Earth would be barren rock with no atmosphere, while the center would be all water. Also, each face of the planet would have its own region with a totally different ecosystem. Also, each face of the planet would have its own region with a totally different ecosystem. The six different sides of Earth would be very similar. They would consist of water, barren rock, and land like we have now. But no matter what side you're on, one thing will be the same. Wherever you walk, it will feel like you're climbing up a steep hill. This is because of the new sense of gravity that would be created. The atmospheric quality along the Earth's edges and corners would actually be too thin. This would mean they would not be able to support life. The Earth would have sharp, steep corners which would poke out beyond the atmosphere. These would be unprotected, and if you stood in them, you'd pass away unless you were wearing a spacesuit. Also, if Earth was a cube, we would have a temperature climate on Earth. This basically means very boring and normal weather and temperatures all around the world. You can wave goodbye to the extremes of hot deserts and icy landscapes. But even if the Earth was a cube, it would eventually turn back into a sphere. Because of its own gravitational effect, over time the Earth would turn back into a sphere. There would also be major disruptions to human, animal, and plant life. That's because our day and night cycles would be out of whack. The moon revolves around Earth in a circular orbit. This is known as an elliptical orbit. But if this no longer happened, it would mean we may have shorter days. Things like internet would also begin to stop working as well. That's because satellites would become out of sync. Much like the moon, satellites revolve around Earth in an elliptical orbit. If this didn't happen, then all of the things we use satellites for would no longer work. They'd need to all be rebuilt differently and deployed back into space. This would cost billions of dollars and take decades to do. So while our world is not perfect, at least it's not cute. I think it's safe to say that planets and large objects in space are spherical for a reason. It seems to work out just fine, but do you think we will ever discover a six-sided planet? And if so, do you think we could inhabit and colonize it? Will a huge asteroid hit Earth on April 29th, 2020? By now, you've likely seen news reports about this asteroid. On the 29th of April, it's going to pass incredibly close to Earth. The asteroid is called 527681998OR2, catchy name I know, and it's actually the biggest asteroid to fly near Earth in years. It's been tracked by astronomers at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico since April 10th, and it's currently traveling through space at 19,461 miles per hour. That's 31,320 kilometers an hour. The asteroid can be seen here in official NASA photographs. The colossal asteroid pinged up on NASA's radars a few days ago, and on the 29th of April it will be visible from Earth. But the question is, will it strike Earth, and if so, where will it hit? The asteroid is known as a NEO. This stands for a near-Earth object. Many asteroids race around the sun at all times, but some are on trajectories that can bring them close to our planet at different times. And sometimes, comets and asteroids come close enough to Earth for them to be NEOs. NASA describes a NEO as an asteroid or comet with a perihelion distance less than or equal to 1.3 AU. 1 AU is an astronomical unit. This is the distance between Earth and the Sun, which is 93 million miles. That's nearly 150 million kilometers. NASA also say that 99% of all NEOs are asteroids. But when will we be able to see asteroid 52768? The space rock will be able to be seen on the 29th of April. It will be going at speeds of nearly 20,000 miles per hour at that time. And it will be around 4 miles long, which is a gigantic rock. If you're in an area without much light pollution, you may be able to see this. But right now, there's speculation this may be a PHA. A PHA is a potentially hazardous asteroid. These are asteroids which NASA pays close attention to. And as you can see, this asteroid is on NASA's list of NEOs this month. Sometimes asteroids require closer observation in case they hit Earth. That's because the gravitational tug of our planet could cause an asteroid to come closer to Earth than we want. The good thing is, if an asteroid did hit Earth, it will likely not hit any humans or any cities. That's because 71% of Earth is water. That means we have a 71% chance of the asteroid hitting the sea, and only 5% of the world is actually populated. This means we'd have to get really unlucky. That's because there's a 95% chance any asteroid would not hit anywhere where people actually live. 
One reason many think the asteroid may hit Earth on the 29th of April is because of a cryptic tweet from Elon Musk. Elon Musk owns the company SpaceX. This company has very close ties to NASA and also the military industrial complex. Two days ago, he posted a meme of the world being hit by an asteroid and destroyed. Then on the moon, it was an astronaut saying, oh no, the economy. This was a reference to another meme about people wanting to reopen the economy despite the current coronavirus. He hit back at the tweet saying, actually it's more like this. So perhaps he knows something about this asteroid that we don't. Or maybe it's just a very scary coincidence. But what was the largest meteor to ever hit Earth? Well, this will be the Chelyablinsk meteor. This was a meteor that struck Earth on the 15th of February 2013. It entered Earth's atmosphere over Russia, and it was even seen on some driver's dash cam cameras. It left a mysterious smoke trail in the sky. Over 7,200 properties and buildings were damaged, and it caused nearly 1,500 injuries. So let's hope this asteroid which is coming to Earth does not hit anywhere occupied. If it does, then we could be in for damage and injuries too. But keep an eye out on the 29th of April and you may well see this humongous asteroid pass Earth.